crowd. Thanks for all coming this morning. Uh, I'm Tino Mantella. I'm president of the Technology Association of Georgia. And uh, today we're pleased to highlight Rolla Huff as our featured speaker. The TAG's featured speaker series is designed to connect our members with individuals who are in the forefront of their respective industries and are accomplished contributors uh, to the Georgia technology community. I do want to uh, thank uh, Stacy Hagen. Where's Stacy? Who's the Chief People Officer for Earthlink who helped to, uh, to set this up. I know we have a number of Earthlink folks here, so uh, welcome. This is uh, not only a featured speaker program this morning, it's also uh, part of our relaunch of one of our 30 societies, the Corporate Development Society. So we, we're looking for companies that are active in the uh, merger and acquisition uh, phase. And uh, so if you're interested in serving on that society board, or if you have a company you think would be uh, a great presenter along those lines, we'd love to have you talk to me or someone on the TAG staff. So back to Rolla. Rolla joined Earthlink in 2007 as the chairman and CEO. And Earthlink is known to many of us certainly as an institution when it comes to internet service and connecting millions of people to the internet. Since joining Earthlink, Rolla has led a restructuring effort to focus Earthlink on its core access and award-winning customer service competencies. In 2010, Rolla led the company to the acquisition of ITC Deltacom, which repositioned Earthlink for long-term strategic value. Over his 20-plus year career, he has held several positions that have earned him notoriety as a business operational and financial strategist. Those positions include former chairman and CEO of Empower Communication and president and CEO officer for Frontier Communication and several roles at AT&T uh, Corporation Wireless. So with that, I'd like to call on Rolla Huff. and uh, good morning everyone. I really appreciate you coming out so early in the morning to spend a few minutes with us. Um, thanks to the TAG group for uh, inviting uh, us here to talk today. You know, TAG's been a it really... Hi Jim, how you doing? It's great to see you. Uh, uh, TAG's really been uh, uh, an important part of the technology community here. You've got a great fan in Stacy Hagen. Um, she's been talking about TAG for time and eternity since I've been here, but it's, it really is a great way for uh, the technology folks in this area to be able to connect and network and learn from one another. And, you know, there's no question about it. In, in Georgia, uh, there is an emerging leadership that is happening in technology. It's, it's why Earthlink is here and will continue to be here. You know, so, so as, we, as we look at the leadership that has been demonstrated already, uh, in, in recent reports around IT communications, the financial <coughs> technology area, information security, Georgia is a, an emerging force in that area. So, uh, so we're we're happy to be a part of it. Uh, Tino, as, as Tino mentioned, we've been Earthlink has been a, a huge part of this community for many years, and it really started um, with Charles Brewer uh, at MindSpring. And I talk to customers every day that uh, still have MindSpring accounts. We love every one of them, and they love their account, and so it works for us. Uh, in 2000, uh, MindSpring and Earthlink merged. Uh, Earthlink was an internet service provider uh, really based in California, and the company moved here under the leadership of Gary Betty. And, you know, you really can't start to talk about Earthlink without talking about the impact that Gary Betty had, not just on Earthlink, but the, the, the impact that he had on the community. He was, a, he was a big part of the community. I didn't have the privilege of getting to know him. He had passed away before I arrived, but I can tell you Gary Betty lives in Earthlink every single day, and he was a, a big part of how we got to, to where we are today. He created a, a culture of just fanatical customer service. And that is the core of what Earthlink is about. Uh, even with Gary's passing, uh, his wife is still an integral part of the community, and we just uh, uh, we have great roots at Earthlink. So um, I, I 
I want to uh, tell you a little bit about our our story, and you know, just like you've heard so many times, the idea that someday somebody's going to write a book about Earthlink, and it's going to be a big book. It's going to be a thick book, and there's going to be a lot of stories uh, in in the book. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is just our chapter in the book. That Earthlink had a, as we talked about, a long history before I got here, and I believe it'll have a long history after I'm gone. But I have had the privilege of being part of a of a chapter in the book, and it was a pretty interesting chapter. And that's really what I'd like to to share with uh, with you. Um, I arrived in June of 2007. And I, uh, Michelle Sadwick is going to do the slides for me, so if I get out of sequence with this, we haven't spent a lot of time preparing for this, but I'm, I'm, she's driving today. But I, I got here in June of 2007, and uh, it was about six months after Gary's uh, passing. And we had a great person uh, in the interim role of CEO, great business guy, um, but he had not been given the reins of the business. The, the business was still very much in the, in the uh, being controlled by the board. And uh, it, was a, it was a tough situation, there's no question about it. Earthlink understood uh, probably uh, in the 2002-2003 time frame that the internet service area needed to, they needed to evolve their product. Uh, Earthlink really relied on monopolies to actually provide them connections uh, to customers. And we all know that, and I came from one, so I, I say this with all knowledge, when you rely on monopolies to be nice to you in your business, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough pull. Um, so the business embarked on a couple of uh, different growth initiatives. Um, one was a, an MVNO in the, in the wireless business. Uh, called Helio. Uh, another one was a big build out of, of uh, uh, municipal Wi Fi networks. Um, you'll never hear me be critical about the decisions to do that because I wasn't here when it, they happened, and I don't know at the time that I, if I would have been here at the same time, I might have very well made the same decisions. But what I do know is that when I arrived, the there was a lot of money being consumed by these two initiatives, and we weren't getting traction. That's the cold reality of it. We were pushing hard to grow our ISP business, but the reality is that the technology cycle had passed us by. Earthlink still had a very valuable product to some consumers, but the technology had changed. There's no question about it. And so we were, we were swimming up that stream, trying to fight that, that reality. We, so we were consuming a lot of cash, we were reporting growing losses, we weren't getting the traction. Uh, we had an activist shareholder that was on the scene and owned 10% of our stock and he was on the war path and you know, when those guys, when those guys uh, enter your neighborhood, it's, uh, bad things start to happen just all the way around. Um, and so, but what was still very much there was people's desire to, to win. With all the issues that Earthlink was facing, this culture of fanatical customer service was still there. And there were, there were people, and so many of them, that were here when I was here, and they've since gone as we've restructured and so on and so forth. And I'm just so pleased that, to, to see you guys here. Uh, but core group of people that still wanted to win. And you know, the thing that I thought was most fascinating, we, went, we began to go through this business restructuring and going through every line of our business, but our people already had figured it out. They, you know, we had to go through the process, but people at their core knew that it wasn't working. And I think, my view is, they, they still had a very strong desire to, to win. And they were willing to make sacrifices, personal sacrifices, job types of sacrifices, but they wanted Earthlink to win and continue in the marketplace. And that's a great platform to build on. So as we, 
as, as we arrived and began to look at things, uh, what we really focused on to begin with was really connecting to the reality of what was happening around us and trying to do it in an incredibly transparent way. And you'll hear that word transparent and I think the, my earthly colleagues will tell you they hear it all the time. It's part of our value statement. Uh, transparency. And you know, when companies are going through massive change, it's disorienting. It's, it's almost like a vertigo that, that takes place. And it takes place, that, that disorientation happens with employees, it happens with shareholders, it happens with partners, it happens with suppliers. People don't understand their position relative to all the changes that are going on. And so they get lost. And so I believe my, my thesis has always been in that kind of time, be completely transparent. Tell people what you're thinking and how you're thinking from the get-go. And that's what we began to do. I think uh, it was the second or third day we did a company-wide podcast. And I, we, we basically talked about the fact that there would be massive change coming. Didn't know what it was. We were going to be thoughtful about it. But we were on an unsustainable path. And importantly, and this was important for, for me before I would come here, uh, everything was on the table. Our board consisted of some really terrific people. One was the founder of Earthlink. Um, there were uh, very strong uh, uh, board members, but it was important that they knew. And by the way, the founder of Earthlink was the CEO of Helio. Uh, one of the MVNOs that was consuming a lot of cash. And so it was really important that we all understood that everything had to be on the table. And I give the Earthling Board <laughs> enormous credit for understanding that, accepting it, and then living up to it. It doesn't always happen that way, but it happened in our situation. So I give, I give the, those folks <laughs> enormous credit. And you know, at the end of the day, there's no question, everybody wanted Earthlink to move forward. And so we got started, and we started going through every line of business. And for the, for the folks that were, that were part of that, that, and some of them are sitting here, you know, we went, through, we went through massive amounts of detail. We started with Helio. Helio was consuming lots of business. My background was more uh, wireless, and and the conclusion that we came to fairly quickly was that <clears throat> it was not going to be possible for us to create shareholder value in that type of in that type of arrangement because we were just reselling again somebody's network and the monopolies would always beat us. We could innovate around the edges, but the monopolies would always beat us. We were in a partnership with SK Telecom and we were <coughs> about to put another hundred million dollars into this motion. So, so we needed to come to some conclusions fairly quickly. So I think it was in my second week that I flew to Korea to have a pretty transparent conversation with uh, our partners and talk very openly about what we were and were likely not going to do. We looked at the, at the uh, Wi-Fi business. I, I, nobody loves wireless more than I do, and there is clearly a place for Wi-Fi in technology. That's been proven, but we were, we were attempting to take hotspot technology and apply it to metropolitan areas, basically having whole cities be hotspots. That's, again, that's a tough model. It, it's a really, it's a tough model, especially just given the, the nature of the technology. Um, so we fairly quickly concluded that the, these two big growth initiatives that were really going to be the future of Earthlink were not going to make it. And because we were out making commitments to municipalities and our partners in, in South Korea, uh, we, had to, we had to make some decisions quickly. And again, we had to be transparent about it. And I tell you, some of the worst days of my four years we're calling these mayors of these municipalities 
and you know the way the conversation sort of went was, uh, Mr. Mayor, we've decided not to give you your free network. <laughs> what? How, how? And so that was not that was not the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. But we were honest with them from the get go. We laid it out. We told them why. We told them we would never make money doing it, and we were not a social organization. We were in business to make money. So we pushed down that path. And then the, the next big thing that we had to deal with was the internet service pr uh, business. Again, we have incredibly loyal customers, incredibly loyal customers. But we were bringing on new customers that weren't incredibly loyal. They were basic, basically <coughs> transitionary customers. And so we began going through every marketing tactic in the company and looking at the profitability. And the cold reality when you cut all through it is what we were paying to acquire a new customer required that the customer be with us for 13 months. Well, new customers had an average life cycle of nine months. Just didn't work. I mean, we could, we could sell all day long, but we were never gonna make money. And so, it really caused us to have to look at the business and face some real realities about what made sense for us to do and, uh, and what didn't. And so in August of 2007, now think about this, that's about 60 days after arrival. So this all happened fairly quick, quickly. We announced a pretty massive restructuring. We went from 1,800 people to 900 people. Um, and all along the way, remember, we were telling folks sort of where we were going in terms of the process. I don't know that people were prepared to hear 900, but they knew that there was a big change coming. But that's where we needed to get to. And the simple proposition to our folks was, we will take care of you. We've got a severance program. Um, in fact, we took it beyond that. We said, for the time that you're with us, you're going to participate in the bonus programs that we have. We're going to, you, you know, the, the, the one real point of clarity that I think everyone had is that the people that were staying were watching very closely how we were treating the people that were leaving. And, you know, that's a, that's a big thing that, that I think most people don't appreciate. It's a hard it's hard to imagine that if a company is going to mistreat somebody that is leaving, that's your colleague, that they really will like you better when, if, if it ever happens with you. And so we thought about that a lot. And how we treated the people that were exiting <clears throat> really was how we kept the people that we so badly needed for the business. So we talked about it a lot publicly. And, you know, I. Uh, it was a really painful time. I, you know, there were, you get those times where you, you're ready to just jump over a, off, a, off a building rather than putting people out of work. I mean, it was an awful time. But the one comfort that we had is that we did treat people the right way. And, it, and everybody knew it, and we've continued to, to do that. So we started down this path of reshaping this business in a much smaller uh, in a much smaller way. And actually, we talked about it as building a smaller business. You know, for, for a company, that's sort of antithetical, you know, building a smaller business. But the reality was that, that you can't just, you, you, the business was still churning off customers. And you have to be proactive in building a cost structure that still provides incredible customer service and still get you to the cost points that you need to get to. And so it's actually an art in and of itself. And I give the Earthling people so much credit because they went after it with a vengeance. People, it was a, it was a period of constant process re-engineering. People were putting themselves out of work. They were coming up with great ideas that they knew put an end to their job. But again, that was that core culture of wanting Earthlink to survive. And it really was just so incredibly important to us. We talked about the culture of, 
the, you know, after we did the big restructuring, and I remember the analysts talking about this, well, you've, you've shot that bullet, there's nothing more you can do. Now it's just a run to the, uh, to the end. <coughs> it wasn't that way at all. We began to talk about doing a thousand little things better tomorrow than we did today. And they, they didn't have to be $100,000 things. If we just made the customer experience a little bit better, or we saved a hundred bucks in how we were how, we're, how we were doing something, uh, it made a difference. And by the way, we shared that value, the creation, with our people. So we had defined how we were going to create value for our shareholders during that period of time, and we made it our business to share that with our folks. One of the things that we did immediately was we stopped the stock option program. Uh, we could give stock options all day, but in a business that's declining, it's fool's gold. And it would have just been, in my judgment, wrong to be giving people something that, that I knew in the back of my mind was never going to be worth anything just to placate them. So we eliminated the program. And we told people why. Uh, we, we gave people a portion of our cash flow. And during the next uh, three or four years, we always made at least target bonus, if not more, because we were creating enormous value for our shareholders. One last point that a key learning of mine as I went through this is we began to talk early on about in a business that's flat or declining, variableizing your cost structure means everything. So if you're going to lose a dollar of revenue, you want to lose most of the cost that's associated with it. And so we really began to be, I think, world class at that, at that thought. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I think there's a mega trend happening in the industry that all of you need to be absolutely tuned into. And it's, it's this mega trend of customers realizing with the economic ups and downs that our country has been going through and will likely go through again the need to have a variable cost structure. And it's going to be an opportunity for Earthlink that I'll talk about in a minute. Well, the good news is our company began to win again. Uh, over the next three or four years, revenue churn went from 5.7% to about 2.5% today, and it's still declining. Uh, we, and, and during that time, our customer satisfaction levels went up. We're at all-time levels in terms of customer satisfaction levels. Not Inconsequentially, we generated $800 million of free cash flow. Uh, we, the activist went away, which was a wonderful thing. I, lots of stories I could tell you about that, but I won't. Um, we had this product that we were developing on the side called New Edge Networks, and it was really a product more than a business. But we, we were starting to see some potential in, in New Edge that was interesting and, and the potential was built around the idea of ubiquitous IP connectivity nationwide and the need for secure private networks. And so that was feel, starting to feel pretty good to us. Uh, we bought back during that period about 25% of our shares because we were generating cash flow. If people didn't, I, and I was having investor meetings and my proposition to them was simple. We're generating enough cash that if you get weak need in the stock, I'll buy it. So trade it down, see what happens. And we bought back 25% of the, of the shares over the last four years. We returned $100 million in dividends. So nobody was pressuring us. It was the right thing to do. And we, we were, during this whole period of time, having this really, in retrospect, almost bizarre conversation with the financial community in our, in our investor calls, telling them, you know, this is what we're thinking about. This is how we're thinking about what we would invest in. And, and uh, we were building a mountain of money uh, all along the way, all along telling investors, this is how we're thinking about the world. Normally, a company like ours that's building this mountain of cash that got to probably a little over $800 million, um, normally you would have investors all over you about giving them the cash back. We weren't getting any of that. We were, we were actually getting a lot of support for the model that we were uh, putting forward. 
But the one thing that we hadn't done yet was set a strategic direction for the future. And I will tell you, it wasn't for lack of thinking about it. We were, I, I would say, a diligence machine. We were looking at everything. <clears throat> um, and, you know, at the end of the day, when we looked at what our, what our alternatives were, there were really three as, as we thought about it. One, you know, generally companies that aren't growing need to be <laughs> private. They're not great public companies. So we could go take the company private. I love the cash flow, but there was a little bit of a twist to that. We had, through a lot of the things that we had done in the past, generated a lot of net operating losses. Now, for those of you that have a connection to finance, you'll know that when a company has a change of control, those net operating losses can't get used. So we hadn't been a taxpayer. So anything that we did that changed the control of the company would have us start paying a lot of taxes. So taking it private was not financially efficient for us. The second thing we could do was employ the idea of, let's just buy more of this. And you know, was, we talked about it as we knew we were a shrinking ice cube, a melting ice cube. Well, why not become a bigger melting ice cube? If you're in that role, just make your ice cube bigger. And so we were looking a lot at you can imagine, the other one or two very large ISPs in the industry. And we gave that a lot of thought, and we chased it. But at, at the end of the day, um, we had to be disciplined in terms of what we would pay, number one, and there had to be a willing seller on the other end. And again, uh, for, another, for another tag meeting, I uh, won't take you through all that, but uh, I sort of equated it to running into a wall about a day every, you know, once or twice a day for two years. I just didn't have good enough sense to stop running into the wall. And then the last alternative was the one that we've spent a lot of time on, which is looking at adjacent industries to look for opportunities to take what we do best and apply it to a different industry. But we had to be really disciplined in our approach. And I remember sitting in a an employee meeting, and this wonderful guy, you know, we get into Q&A, and, and, you know, we're, we got seven or eight hundred million dollars in cash, and I asked if there was any questions, and the person raised his hand, and he said, dude, how much more cash do we need before you buy something? You're killing us out here, because, you know, we, we continue to make sure that our cost structure stayed in line. And, you know, God bless the guy. He, you know, everybody was involved in our M&A thinking at the time. I mean, everybody in the company was, was really engaged in this thought. But when you think about what we were solving for, there were, there were two or three things. Number one is we had to buy a company that was big enough to match up against what is still a very large ISP business that trades at, trades at a low valuation multiple. It has... Lots of cash flow, but it has a low valuation multiple. So for us to go out and buy a business that $100 million of revenue that's growing at 25% a year, we could do that. We would match it up with the ISP, and it would immediately trade down to three times until it got bigger than the ISP. So we had that reality. We had the philosophy of no bleeders. I wasn't going to buy something that was hemorrhaging cash, not given our our. Uh, I, the profile of our ISP business. And third, we had to buy something that was in the same zip code of the multiple we were trading at. So when you put those three things together, there, there weren't a lot of things. I, you know, we, we looked at everything. And there were times when we were having pretty serious dialogue with everybody about, we may not find something. We might be so unique that the best thing that to do with our company is to just run the thing out for cash. Nobody wanted to do that, but nobody wanted to do something stupid either. So that was, that was what we were solving against. You know, we, we had one other major thing that was happening. And it's the thing that I think really shaped the destiny of Earthlink. 
and will probably continue to shape its destiny. And that is, there was a major market meltdown that occurred in late 2008, early 2009. And it really changed the world for us. We were sitting on a mountain of money when there was no liquidity anyplace. We had little debt. The fact that we had been disciplined and hadn't been doing venture investing, all of a sudden our cash was worth more than cash. It was, it, it, it became a very big asset to us in a time where nobody had it. <coughs> so we actually made a few offers to buy companies. You know, everybody's buying data centers right now. In February of 2009, which I think was the low point of the, the high point of the liquidity crisis, the low point of the, we made offers to buy two or three different data centers at, I don't know, I think it was six or seven times. Now those things are trading at 14 or 15 times. I've always said, if, if we could have had the liquidity crisis just last another 90 days, we could have been in a, talking to you about a whole different business right now. We had to be opportunistic. As soon as the liquidity came back into the market, the valuations went up and we were right back where we were. <coughs> It was, a, it was a real roller coaster ride. Well, I'm happy to, to say that we, we continued the dialogue. We were very interested in fiber assets, had been for um, a good long time. And in October of uh, 2010, uh, we uh, announced that we were acquiring ITC DeltaCom. Um, we had been talking to them for a couple of years before. They were looking for valuations that were substantially higher than what we felt we could pay. Um, but in October, it was clear they were running a process. And if you look, it's, it's all in the public, uh, it, it, it's in public filings in the background of the merger. There were three other bidders for the asset. We were the low bidder. <laughs> but we bid with absolute financial certainty. We didn't have to say, look, we'll pay you this price, but we're gonna to have to go get financing, and so you know, we're gonna to have to do this with a financing contingency. That wasn't our deal. It was, here's the value, and we will, we will pay cash. And obviously, we, uh, we uh, won that deal. We loved it because it was deep fiber network. To a company that didn't have network, it felt like it felt awesome to have a, a real underlying network in an emerging region of the country. We loved the management team. It was an experienced management team. It was a company that had not been starved off, so there weren't negative synergies. So we thought that was the right starting point. Well, it was like when that happened, the flag went down on the industry. And within weeks, uh, a company called One Communications announced that they were, uh, that they were um, on the market. And so we participated in that auction. And again, we were the lowest bidder on the table, and we bid cash, no financing contingency. And we won that bid. And so very quickly, we had a, an East Coast network that was substantial. Interestingly, both of these companies weren't bleeding cash. They had their unique issues, but they were not bleeding cash. So when you think about the three things that we were solving for, it fit it. The valuation multiples were right. On a blended basis, we bought those things at a little over four times. They weren't bleeding cash, and they gave us immediate scale to the point that now two-thirds of our revenue is in, this, is in business services. And it really matched up well with the new edge asset that was coming along well. You know, I don't have my iPad with me. I always use it as a prop. But think of new edge. If this is the country, and Florida's like right about here, this is the coverage that new edge had in terms of being able to go to our customers and offer them private networks wherever they were. So we were starting to bring on customers that had 100, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 locations across the country, not just in New York, but in Fargo, North Dakota. And we could put them all on a private network with class of service, MPLS network. The problem with that business, of course, was 
the network was about this thin. And generally, when you have networks this thin, the margins are not terrific. And remember, we have this sort of crazy notion that businesses should make money. So just <laughs> being out there generating revenue but not having any chance to make it profitable, who cares? I'm too old to do that. I, you know, it's just, it's just I, 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 that's for the younger folks to do. I, I like businesses that make money. And so the two networks that we bought underpinned that strategy. So now we had nationwide reach and we had network economics under half of the country. We like that idea. The same week we announced One Communications, we also bought a little company in South Florida called STS Communications. It was a hosted voice over IP company. In one lata, they were selling about a million and a half dollars a month. And what was really great about it, it was a business that sat on our network in South Florida. And we weren't the network provider. Important point. And so this little business has become incredibly accretive for us. Not only that, but we're going to take that product and against that nationwide map that you just saw, we will, you will see us this fall become a nationwide voice over IP uh, provider. It, because New Edge reaches into about 13,000 colos across the country, co-locations. So incredible reach. It's a new product that we have. You know, New Edge, would, we had no voice revenue on that. It was a data network. We, Earthlink at our core is an IP company. We think about it, we think about the world that way. In fact, I would dare say that we were one of the original cloud companies. Because when you think about what we are, we're two very large data centers, and we operate a virtual environment for our customers to come in and buy things, um, uh, sell things, get content. So we've been in that world. We bill our customers through two million credit cards that sit out in the cloud. And so we get network security really well. So, so it was at our core to, to do this. It was in our DNA. We just needed the assets. And so STS gave us the voice platform. A week or two ago, we announced that we had just acquired another little company. And these were not the big mega deals. In fact, they were small enough that I'm not, I'm not a, much to Michelle's chagrin, I'm not a big public kind of guy. That's, I think execution is more important than press releases. But we bought this little company called Logical Solutions. And Logical was, uh, was an amazing company for us. It gave us a virtual platform. So instead of building 100,000 foot data centers, we're going to create a virtual platform. We're not going to sell space and power. We think that's really bubbly right now. We may have the chance to buy space and power in the next year or two at a whole different set of economics. But we, that platform will give us a virtual computing platform, a virtual hosting platform. And it will be an inc a, a really important part of what Earthlink begins to focus on uh, and evolve to, which is a substantial managed services business. It is in our blood. It, it, it is what we do well. It, and so we'll, we will leverage a lot of our roots around building out uh, this product. And we're going to make our consumer business the biggest reference site <coughs> there is. We will, we will use our consumer business um, and demonstrate how virtual platforms do work, how flow-through processes do work, how variabilizing your cost structure does work. That will be the new Earthlink. And so we've got a lot more to do in terms of bringing the companies together and integrating them, but we've got a solid platform that cable companies can't match. Um, even the even in the industries that we're competing at, the competitive local exchange companies, they are where they are. On an emerging basis, our biggest competitor is once again AT&T. They're the only ones with the national reach that can compete with the product that, that, uh, 
we have out there. And importantly, we've gotten there at the right kind of valuation. The network that we have, there was $3.2 billion invested in the network that we have. In the billion dollars of revenue that we've acquired, there was a little over $2 billion spent to acquire. And we've been able to pull these assets together for right at a billion dollars. So we like our position. We like the fact that we're incredibly financially viable. We'll have substantial, I'm not <coughs> making you insiders, but what we've talked about, we don't give revenue guidance, but um, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, we've got guidance out there about uh, between 300 and 315 million dollars for 2011, and that only includes nine months of one com. Uh, we've got capex of about 120 million, so we'll generate about 200 million dollars of free cash flow. We've got less than one and a half times leverage, um, so but we're not going to lose our discipline. We're not going to lose our focus on what's important. So I'll end this with sort of my learnings. And I, I don't know that they'll be useful to you, but it's, it's I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old enough now that I'm, I, I don't know how you guys are, but I get to be reflective. And I reflect a lot on what worked and what didn't work and, and how, you know, how I should think about the last four years. One thing, transparency means everything. In, in this world of incredible volatility and change, just laying it out there and trusting that people are strong enough to take the real news and not sugarcoating stuff and letting people plan their lives in one direction and then dropping the bomb on them the next day, just lay it out there. Transparency means a lot if you're trying to solve the vertigo of massive change. Every company has to have a value system. And you either create it or it gets created for you. And, you know, we, the ones that sort of get created off to the side, um, I think, can be more difficult. And we've seen that in... in you know, one and at least one acquisition where the the value system and the culture made it difficult for the company to be successful. So we spend a lot of time talking about our value system in, in this business. And I think the final thing beyond the need to create businesses that make money as opposed to uh, sound like good press releases is and this especially for you folks who are uh, so involved in the technology arena. Every technology has a life cycle. And whatever you're working on right now, I can pretty much assure you that there will, you, there's a beginning point, a middle point, and a declining point. And there's value to be created for yourself and for your shareholders if you plug into reality and recognize the changes. Earthlink and our ISP business is an incredible business. I love it. It's older technology, but we do something important for an important group of people, and they're incredibly loyal to us. Incredibly loyal to us. So it's not that a declining technology can't be a good business. It can be a great business, but understanding what a technology is and where it is in its life cycle and how that fits with what's happening in broader economic cycles <coughs> should be meaningful to everyone sitting in this room. And your knowledge of that and awareness of that, I think, will, will put you in a better position. I really appreciate the time uh, and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody uh, might have. This is a, this is, Earthlink is a, uh, is still a story being written. We, we can anticipate what the next few chapters can look like and it puts a smile on our face. We're all standing here because of a terrific group of people, not just the ones that we have today, but the ones that were here 
two years ago and three years ago and five years ago. Everybody had a part of putting this company in a position to have a different story and, and you know, I'm just, I've just been so fortunate to be a part of that. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, yes ma'am. Great story, Melinda. Sounds like you're <coughs> The question I have is now that you are purchasing some of these other companies and bringing them into the fold, how do 